All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, August is Retro Computing Month, I guess. I, did anyone get the memo? Um, <laughs> uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, Commodore 64 assembly in 2024. Uh, has anyone not heard of the Commodore 64? It's okay if you haven't. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, so um, basically, in short, it was uh, like one of the first consumer personal computers. Um, at one point, it was the most popular computer in homes. Uh, came out in 1983, um, and I decided I wanted to learn how to write uh, assembly language for the Commodore 64. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to start off with kind of explaining what assembly language is for those of you who are unfamiliar. Uh, sometimes it's called assembler. Um, I like to call it assembly language. It just sounds more right. Um, but assembly language is actually like sort of a misnomer. Uh, it's more of a category of languages. Uh, there's a lot of different assembly languages. Uh, they all share a lot of traits in common, but um, yeah, there's a lot of different ones. So I'll, I'll talk about some of those different variants later. Um, but pretty much with some nuance, they're uh, one step away from the binary or the machine language that the CPU and like the very low level hardware understands. So like it's one step up from those ones and zeros. So it's about as close as any like reasonable human can get to writing exact instructions to uh, the CPU or again that other hardware that talks directly to the CPU. Um, so what can we do with assembly language? Um, not that <laughs> not that much uh, line by line. So you can add and subtract numbers. Some assembly languages allow you to multiply and divide numbers, which is pretty fancy, but not in the Commodore 64, not exactly anyway. You have bit shifting and rotating, uh, which I'm not going to dive into too much, but that's part of what would be involved um, if you want like, to do a fast multiply or a fast divide. Um, you can store and load values in and out of memory. Um, this typically is byte by byte, uh, so it's very... Again, it's exact instructions. You're saying store this byte into this place in memory, load a byte from this place in memory. Um, and uh, in the Commodore 64 and a lot of other assembly languages or a lot of other architectures, that's also how you interact with I.O. devices. Uh, so I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, so you can compare values. Uh, you can handle interrupts. So for example, the keyboard, usually uh, when you press a key, that sends what's called an interrupt to the CPU to say like, hey, um, you know, the user did something, handle this first and then go back to the program. Uh, and then system calls. So uh, the Commodore 64 doesn't have an operating system per se. It has uh, what's called a, a kernel. Um, so there are some sort of like stored procedures, you could say, in the kernel uh, for really common uh, functions, but um, so you can, you can call system calls too, which is actually also sort of another way of interacting with memory in a sense. Uh, again, I'll explain that in a minute. But uh, notably what's not built in, just like a few examples of what isn't built in that we take for granted, is any kind of like print function that doesn't exist, at least not in the Commodore 64. Uh, there's not even like a console or anything. Uh, so you can't do that. You have to manually say like print this character to this place in screen memory. Um, if, if conditions, if statements, if blocks, like those don't really exist. You can, so you can do comparisons and then you can branch based on the result of that comparison, which is effectively like an if statement, but it's not as clean, it's not as easy as that. Uh, and then similarly with loops, you can't just write a for loop or a while loop. Uh, you know, we're all used to doing that in our modern languages. It's not that easy, it's not, or it's not that simple um, in assembly. So who uses this weird set of languages? Uh, so uh, at least in the modern age, uh, some compiler writers might use assembly. Um, actually, probably not that many these days, but maybe for cert ver certain very like niche or specific functions, they might still write some assembly. Um, similarly, like with embedded driver and operating system developers, I think maybe it's possible that occasionally they're writing some 
assembly, but more likely they're writing C or these days Rust. Um, probably not doing too much assembly. Uh, and then you have hobbyists. That probably makes up, these days it probably makes up the majority of people who write assembly. Uh, so in other words, basically no one. Um, very, very few people choose to write assembly or uh, even fewer are certainly doing it professionally. Um, and I looked at the Stack Overflow survey from last year on the most popular language, languages, and assembly sits at 4.42%, pretty low on the list. Um, but the moral of the story is that it's still more popular than VBA. Uh, <laughs> but that's a low bar, so. <laughs> uh, so it sounds like it kind of sucks, right? Like, who, who would do this to themselves? Um, well, you know, some people like to, uh, like to take on the challenge, do something a little bit different, um, try and work within the constraints and the limits of this, you know, whatever environment or whatever language you're tasked with writing. Um, so why should we learn this, or why should I learn this? Why would anyone want to learn this in 2024? It's fun. Um, I think it's fun. I like old hardware, old software. Um, so yeah, I thought it would be cool. Um, it's hard. I enjoy the challenge. Um, I mean, yeah, <laughs> what else can you say? Um, I think though, like most importantly, it'll make you a better programmer. Um, and I don't think the, the reasons are super obvious or, or even that like direct. Um, but my goal is to kind of uh, convince you of these three points by the end of the presentation and especially on that last point. So I'll come back to that. Um, but like I said, there's different variants of assembly. They're all architecture specific. Uh, so, um, and even within some of these, there might be like sub variants. I'm not totally sure. I'm, I'm certainly not an expert. But uh, x86, this is probably what most of our uh, like desktop computers, some laptops are using. It's uh, probably the most popular if you exclude like smartphones and stuff. But uh, most of the smartphones, mo uh, a lot of embedded devices these days are using ARM architecture, so that'll have a separate assembly language. Uh, MIPS, so this is probably going back a little bit, but uh, a lot of game consoles back in the day were on MIPS architectures, uh, the, like the Nintendo 64, for example. Uh, the Xilog Z80, um, so I think uh, some of the Sega systems used uh, the Z80. The uh, TI-83 and TI-84 uh, graphing calculators used the Z80. Uh, the Game Boy used like some kind of like hybrid of the Z80, I think, or some like variant of the Z80. I remember Josh gave a talk on that last year, I think. Um, and then we get to the 6502, 6510, which is almost the same exact thing. And that's what the Commodore 64 is. Um, and then there's many more, um, which you know I don't know and I'm not gonna get into. Um, so most of our uh, programs, like most of our first programs in any given language is like a simple hello world, right? Um, I thought that was boring. So we're gonna mix it up a little bit. We're gonna go a little crazy. Hello, Lancaster. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so uh, I figured I would show a few just simple examples that we've all seen before in languages we've seen before. Python, simple one-liner. Super clean, super nice, doesn't get better than that. Uh, C sharp as of .NET 6 can also be done in one line. Uh, not, not too much more verbose, it's pretty nice. Uh, C, okay, we're getting a little crazier. Four lines of code, you could probably shorten this a little bit, but um, still easy to understand. Um, then we have brain fuck, which, you know, <laughs> you guys get this, right? Come on. Um, so this is Commodore 64 assembly. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna break this down a little bit. We're not gonna worry too much about uh, going line by line at the moment, but I just wanted to kind of do the comparison to show, yeah, it's not as simple as just a print, um, which makes it challenging, but also fun. So um, the, the architecture of the Commodore 64, uh, this is a, sort of memory map, uh, so you have higher addresses at the top, lower addresses at the bottom. The addresses are in hexadecimal, um, and uh, we were given kind of that bottom half-ish of memory space to work with in terms of where our program, where our sprites go. Um, 
anything kind of above that cart ROM low, I think, is more or less reserved. I think there's some nuance there. But I mentioned earlier that the I.O., you interact with it similarly to how you interact with memory. So if you wanted to interact with the SID chip, with, which is the sound processing chip, so if you wanted to make sound with your program, you'd be writing to these memory locations on the SID chip. Uh, similarly, the VIC chip, that's kind of like the display processor. Uh, then you have different I.O. devices. You work with that as if you're working with memory, because uh, you kind of are, in a sense. Um, similarly, I mentioned the kernel. Uh, so for those system calls, you're just interacting with memory um, in terms of the assembly that you're writing. Question for you. Sure. You say it doesn't have an OS, it still has a kernel. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the kernel, you can think of the kernel as an operating system. I think a lot of people would, a lot of, like, elitists or purists might no, fight with it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. It, it is, so, it is a set of uh, routines available for you to run. Right. It is not running. Right. It's, it's not really, system, yeah. yeah. There's no, there's so, for example, there's no file system that it's managing. There's no, uh, Yeah, it gets into definitions, which, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lightning talk, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we, we have, <laughs> we have 64 kilobytes of memory total, um, yeah, and uh, um, so yeah, like I said, that lower half-ish is what we actually have to work with. Um, so not, sure, yeah. That's, that's a really good question that I don't know <laughs> the answer to, to be honest. I, so I haven't gotten into like doing sound, uh, sound processing or anything. Um, so I'm not, I'm not 100% sure on the answer to that. Um, yeah. Right, and, the, and I think the sound chip, um, if someone knows better than me, then please correct me where I'm wrong. But from what I understand, the sound chip is basically a separate processor on its own, too. So I think from what I, from what I understand or what I can guess is that like, you set up the memory, like the literal memory in advance for that sound, um, and then you give an instruction to the sound chip to play the sound or whatever. It's probably not that simple, but then it goes and does that. Um, and you can continue to execute the program on the CPU, like other than the sound stuff. Uh, but I'm not 100% on that. That's a, that's a great question. Um, but yeah, so there's there's no built-in storage. Um, there were floppy drives, of course, for the Commodore 64 cartridges, uh, but nothing built in, uh, or, or nothing uh, non-volatile anyway. Uh, everything's volatile memory. So. Whatever you write in here, if you don't have it on a floppy disk, it disappears as soon as you turn it off. We also had a cassette. Yeah, that's true. Yep, there's a cassette drive too. Yep. Um, so uh, the registers. So registers are you can think of them sort of like your variables, um, except they exist on the CPU rather than in memory, uh, which makes them extremely fast. Um, but uh, what's challenging with the Commodore 64 specifically is you only have like really three uh, working registers, like registers that you can really utilize um, freely. 
uh, and those are the accumulator, the X register, and the Y register. Uh, and they're all 8 bits in size, uh, which is yet another challenge. So each of those registers can only hold values from 0 to uh, 255 when signed. Um, so if you have to do any math uh, with numbers like larger than that, uh, it gets tr tricky. You have to start putting stuff in memory or sort of like uh, working with more than one register at a time. Uh, there's the program counter, which uh, I, don't, I think normally you never really have to worry about too much, but that's basically how the CPU knows uh, where in the program it is. Uh, and then the status register, which uh, holds eight flags, uh, just kind of like bitwise flags that uh, store the state of the um, result of like the previous instruction sort of. Uh, so, um, for example, if the, if the result of the previous instruction was zero, there's a zero flag that gets set. So you can use that for, um, for like the branching that I talked about earlier. Um, the screen RAM, um, so the screen itself, uh, at least in, in text mode to keep it simple, is just uh, a block in memory. By default, it's at 0400 hex uh, to that 077. Uh, so 1,000 bytes um, in, in the RAM, and you can write directly to these different locations. So um, I kind of have arrows pointing to the different cells, so to speak. Uh, so 0400, 0401 is the next one to the right, and so on. Um, the color for each of those cells also have their own bytes in memory, so you can write different color codes to those different places to change the color. Uh, the border has its own single byte in memory for the entire border color. Um, so kind of as an exercise, that where we're pointing to in that first column, second row, that's going to be if we add, if we add what to 0400, what will be that one that doesn't have an answer yet, the one that I'm pointing to? Anyone? Yeah, we add 40, which is hex. 2.8. So yeah, we're, we're adding 40 to get to the next one. Uh, so that's how you'd work with the different places on the screen to draw what you want. Um, so quick example, um, if we wanted a red border uh, and we wanted to draw, it's super hard to see, it's really small, but an A on top of a Z, uh, the A is black, the Z is green, uh, we'd load up the red color to the accumulator, that LDA, load accumulator with uh, hex 2. Um, that's the, the red color code in the Commodore 64. And then we're going to store the value of the accumulator into Z D020, which is, again, the border color. Um, and then for the background color, uh, similar type of thing. We load the color white to the accumulator, store that to where the background color is in memory, D021. Um, load the black color, uh, and store that at D800, uh, which is the color for the text in that first sort of cell. Um, load the character A, which is 1, store that at 0400, uh, and so on and so forth. You kind of get the idea. I tried to comment it to make it as clear as possible, even though it's hard to read what's going on. Josh. What is the significance of the hash lines? Ah. Um, I believe that's like a, I, ha I think that has something to do with like an immediate, um, I actually don't know that it's necessary in this context. I think it's more important for memory addressing um, the difference. Um, so that's a really good question. I think it's just a habit that I got used to. <laughs> um, the hash like, to the left of the value, so like that in that first line, LDA hash, yeah. That would be the dollar sign. Yeah, yeah. So without the, do so it would mean the same thing for that first line, like two hex is the same as two decimal. But uh, but yeah, for those memory addresses, like uh, without the dollar sign, that wouldn't work. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And every and every assembly is different too. They might have different rules about how numbers are expressed. Um, Mm -hmm. So that, like, A has its, its value, like, an hash. But then, like, uh, 
It's not ASCII, oh, but yeah, but yeah, it has, it's mapped to a code, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there are character sets that come with, they, they come in like the ROM of the Commodore 64. I think you can actually, you can overwrite those with your own fonts if you had them. Um, and uh, kind of along those lines, uh, it, again, super hard to see, I understand, but um, I did include kind of like the mapping for the first 128 characters of like the standard code page, if you will, uh, character set. Uh, so one is A, uh, I, I'm sure you can't see that. <laughs> but yeah, one is A, and then it goes up to 20, 26 for Z, um, which I think segues nicely into looping. Uh, so here's another example where uh, we start at uh, 0400, that first cell uh, memory address. Um, before that, we kind of just set up some, some memory. These are like more, more analogous to uh, like variables. So current screen offset, we're just saying we want to allocate a byte and it's gonna start out at zero. Same thing for the current character, but it's gonna start at one, which is like the character A code. Um, and then we're gonna jump into this uh, print character uh, I have to be careful with the word function. It's really just a place in memory, but you can sort of think of it as a function. Um, and we're gonna load up the current character and the, the screen offset uh, into the X register, which is a little bit important. The X is usually used as an offset or as an index. Um, and we're gonna store the accumulator, which has the current character code, into 0400 at offset x. So the first time you run this, the offset's zero, so we're gonna store it literally at 0400. Zero. Uh, then we're gonna increment both of our variables. Uh, we're gonna compare to decimal 26, and if it's not equal to 26, then that B and E is a branch if not equal uh, to the print character label. So it's gonna sort of that, that's basically how the loop works. It's, it's almost like a while loop. While it's not 26, branch back to print character. Uh, so it's gonna run that until, it, until the, uh, the value of the accumulator is 26, and then, um, and then it's gonna move on to the rest of the program or just end if there's nothing left. Uh, so that's what that looks like. This, I ran this in the emulator and this is what you get. The contrast isn't great, but you get the idea. Um, so back to our Hello Lancaster example. Uh, so it's the same exact program I showed before, but with comments. That first basic upstart thing, that's just a mac an assembler macro. Um, so that's where, uh, when I said earlier that these are, um, this is as close as you get to uh, machine language, this is kind of one of the slight exceptions, is that some assemblers have macros that can kind of do things for you. Just you know, bootstrap the program basically is what this is doing. Um, the star equals uh, 4,000, uh, we're just saying our program, you know, load our program into memory location 4,000. Uh, the first few, the first like 100 bytes I think of memory are sort of special. They're used by like interrupts and stuff so you don't want to go there. Um, so we just put it in 4,000, that gives us plenty of space. Uh, then we have our labels. Uh, so I mentioned system calls earlier, syscalls, uh, so that immediately under the start line, uh, we have JSR E544. So JSR is jump to subroutine, and then the subroutine is, lives in that E544 memory location, um, which is built into the kernel. Uh, and that just clears the screen. So it's a very common functionality that whoever designed the kernel figured, yeah, they're gonna wanna be able to clear the screen, so we'll just include it here. Um, after that, after that returns, we jump to the draw text, and then we have another loop, so we just went over loops. Uh, it's a similar type of thing. Uh, we do have a message variable, which has our hello Lancaster string in here. It's padded by some spaces. Um, but we load up the first byte of that message uh, right under that draw loop, 
Um, and then we loop through and uh, until we get to hex 28, which is decimal 40. Uh, that's the length of our string there, the, our padded string. And when it's done, done it returns to uh, where we called it, that jump star, which just goes back to the start of the program. And it just infinitely loops. Um, and yeah, it works. So pretty simple, very simple program. That's about as simple as it gets. Um, you add sprites, you add interrupt handling, blood, sweat, tears, and you can get something like this. Uh, I didn't make this, but this is uh, a game called Summer Games, I believe, uh, which is like an Olympics type thing, very topical, um, or it would have been a month ago. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this is a, like a real example, very popular game for the Commodore 64. Um, and it just kind of shows what's possible if you uh, really spend a lot of time um, and are way smarter than I am. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty cool. And it has sound and stuff and everything. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, the title of this talk is uh, Commodore 64 Assembly in 2024. If you really hate yourself, you can write assembly on a Commodore 64 directly. I do have a Commodore 64, but I'm not going to do that to myself. Uh, I like the modern tools, uh, and they do exist for Commodore 64 assembly. So Kick Assembler, uh, that's a modern assembler. Um, so it turns your assembly code into that machine code that the, uh, the Commodore 64 can run. Uh, Vice, which is a Commodore 64 emulator, uh, it runs on every modern operating system. Uh, and then VS Code has some extensions that work with both Kick Assembler and that emulator. So you get debugging and, uh, and like, um, assemble on save uh, type functionality. Uh, so for example, that's what my settings.json in VS Code looks like. You just point it to your exe and your Java file and that's basically it. Um, so the debugging is like super nice. Um, I'm wondering if the uh, Commodore 64 assembly language writers, uh, like the people who made games and stuff, uh, what they would think of this type of tool today. I think the assemblers back then did have some like rudimentary debugging capabilities, but this is super nice. You can see the values of all your registers, all the flags. Um, you can set breakpoints wherever you want. Uh, you can even like sort of peek into memory. So at the bottom there, you can put your own watches in and to say, you know, what are the eight bytes at uh, memory or uh, hexadecimal 4,000 in memory, which is the, the first eight bytes of the program, um, super nice. Like basically crucial in my opinion if you're trying to do this today. Um, so I was really hoping, uh, I, I guess I kind of have a theme tonight of like unfinished projects, but um, I was really hoping to have something uh, for Conway's Game of Life done uh, in Commodore 64 assembly for tonight. Unfortunately, I, I just wasn't able to finish it. Uh, I did start it. Um, and so this is what uh, Conway's Game of Life looks like, if you're unfamiliar with it. It's basically like a cellular automata, like uh, simulation type thing. So there's rules about what cells survive and based on the number of neighbors and whatnot. Um, and I think it's really cool. It's just a couple steps uh, beyond the standard Hello World stuff. Um, a little more, comp just complicated enough to, I feel like, really get a feel for what the language is like. So I like to implement Conway's Game of Life in different languages that I try out. Um, but so, yeah, I don't have it done for tonight, but I don't know, maybe Lightning Talk sequel, like if I, if I ever finish it. Um, so yeah, some of the challenges, and I kind of talked about some of this, the 8-bit architecture means that uh, you're working with values that have an unsigned range of 0 to 255. Uh, and the, for example, the screen itself is 1,000 bytes. So as soon as you get past that 255th cell on the screen, uh, you got to think about how you're going to do math around the rest of those bytes. Um, and, and yeah, manipulating 16-bit addresses is tricky. So you have a 16-bit address space, uh, but you only have eight bits to work with at a time. Uh, so you have to kind of think about that. You have to come up with some tricks to be able to do what you want to do. Um, Multiplication and division, again, I talked about this. There's no built-in opcodes for the Commodore 64 for this. You need to roll your own or steal it from the internet, um, which is what I did. Uh, so there are places that have 
you know, uh, if you need to uh, multiply two 8-bit numbers and get out a 16-bit product, here's what that looks like, uh, uh, the fastest possible thing. It's like 90 lines of code or something. Um, and again, limited memory. There's only, um, I think that's actually a little bit lower than actual, uh, but 30-something kilobytes of usable memory. Um, that includes your program, your sprites, your sounds, everything. Your entire program has to fit in that, excluding you know, if you have um, a floppy disk or a cassette or whatever. But um, yeah, if you're loading it directly into the RAM, that's all you get. Um, so what did we learn? Uh, I mentioned earlier that there were kind of three things that I wanted to convince you of. Uh, it's fun. So I don't, know, I don't know if I did a great job of this one. Uh, I think you kind of just have to have uh, the desire to do stuff like this. And it's OK if you, if you don't. But I think it's fun. I think it's fun to try, try hard things, um, which, yeah, it is hard. I think it's like objectively hard. Um, hopefully, I was able to convince you of that. <laughs> um, but it'll make you a better programmer. So I think. At least from my perspective, is uh, there's a couple things here. First of all, I think it's really easy to take for granted the modern tools that we have, the modern languages. Uh, you know, you just you write a line or two of code, um, and it seems so simple, but we never really think about what's happening at all the layers underneath, let alone the very bottom. Um, so I think. Once you start writing assembly, or once I start, started writing assembly, it was just deeply humbling uh, to, to know that like, so much work from so many different people over decades um, allowed us to uh, you know, perform our jobs or to do what we do today in these modern languages. Um, and I, I think also, too, just uh, you have to approach problems in a very different way in assembly versus modern languages. And I think uh, just like every time you have to do something like that, it's sort of like there's this concept of like brain plasticity and stuff where um, you like, I think just having the experience of having to learn something in a completely different way, when you return to a modern language or something like that, even, even though it might not be like a direct translation, you know, you're not working with bytes of memory super directly, but just having that uh, ability to reframe a problem in a completely different way, I think can be super powerful. And I think uh, learning assembly has done that for me. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, if you are interested in learning Commodore 64 assembly, uh, there's a QR code uh, that you can scan that's just a link to these exact slides which has links on resources, the extensions that I use, um, as well as the CodeBase64. That's just like a repository for uh, different pre-written algorithms and stuff for, again, those things like uh, multiplication and division. Um, and it's been super helpful for me. So yeah, that's it. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I did, I did forget to mention, I meant to mention that if you are learning assembly for the very first time, I don't necessarily suggest Commodore 64 to start. Um, I mean, you certainly can. I think MIPS is a lot more forgiving. I did learn that in college a few years ago. Um, it's got a lot more opcodes, uh, multiplica multiplication and division, and even like floating point numbers, which is huge. Um, that's all, that's all built in, which is super nice. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, why, why Commodore 64 over like anything else? Um, so I think part of it is just my fascination with the Commodore 64. So like I said, I, I do have one. I got one a few years ago. I think it's just a super cool system. Uh, it has such a legacy. I mean, so does the Apple II, of course. Um, but yeah, I think the Commodore 64 just hits closer to home just because I have one. But maybe I'll get an Apple II someday. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll do another talk. <laughs> Good question. Anyone else? Um, you had like Olympic games. Uh, yeah. Like the, the, the game developers at the time, like in 84 or whatever, yeah. were they writing assembly or did they have a higher level of understanding of writing 
That's a good question. I don't know for certain, um, but I don't, I don't think there was much in the way of higher level. I mean, there was basic. So um, Commodore, Commodore 64 came, shipped with basic on the ROM, um, but for a game of that caliber, I'd be surprised if they wrote that in basic because it's so slow. Uh, most games, most like, you know, actual games at that time, I think were written in assembly. I don't think C really was a thing, or at least not for the 64, C64 at that point. I don't know of any other higher level languages that were available at the time, if any. Um, Yeah. Yeah, uh, please. I'm an old Pelos developer. Okay. So the first 20 years of my experience, I was doing a Pelos care plan, and you know it's not a it's a long time. So I can tell you that Rockaway from Pelos started in 76, and by that time, IBM had a language called PLX, which was very similar to PL1, but it was just PL1. But PLX is what IBM was using to develop its operating for instructions to, to create a Dell data element that was actually an instruction set. And we proved that part of Portland code was just an LS351, just some firmware thing. The processor things that you wanted to do that wasn't part of the higher level language, we mm. actually fed that in and said, go ahead and execute that. And the color came through with the complete that color code. Okay, interesting. <laughs> what is the hashtag? Well, in my day, we used to call it pound, pound signs. signs. Yeah. Pound signs typically would be used to denote hexadecimal numbers. Uh, okay. Four digit hexadecimal numbers. Uh, just terms and stuff that people that you know, aren't aware of some of the history of what was going on. So we use that all the time. Interesting. And that's why I say in the phone, or octopus is something we forget to mention. Pardon me? <laughs> pound signs. So the pound sign came from the phone. Octopus is the name of that. Yeah. Uh, but I'm saying the computer science, uh, computer science yeah. era back then, we would just create the pound sign with those magic words. And this was written with the other name of Octopus too. Oh yeah, yeah. Like the first symbol that was written down was the phone. Oh yeah. The S magic. <laughs> 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 and the other thing I want to mention is the whole thing further was about the assembly and you said assembly, we, we call it assembler because we, we apply it up here. But the mnemonic for assembler is a one-to-one one -one, uh, association with a um, uh, bit instruction. Mm -hmm. So these instructions that have a set of binary codes and they're all hexadecimal and what the length of it was and then there would be classes, what we call it in classes, like this is what we call assembler. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, and I, I, I tried to make that point, but also, uh, so early assemblers, it was probably much more direct. Um, I think over time, the assemblers did start to add some quality of life where not every instruction necessarily mapped to a single CPU instruction. There were like pseudocodes. Yeah, essentially, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Right, yeah. I have a few old Android phones from when we used to develop the design, but they probably had toolkits and means that were very primitive as opposed to this. 
Yeah, for a common. Yeah, 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 exactly. So the first compilers would correctly place errors in the assent language for such exact specific applications, and uh, later on they came up with something called C code. So the compiler replaces it by C code, which is a rudimentary code, and then you can take that C code and run it with the assent language. So I could create an application, and I'm going to say C for running code, but just Google it. I could create an application in C, and draw them out of Mm -hmm. I.e. changing that C code to one of the language that was possibly uh, on C code. Yeah, and I think that's that's s similar in a sense to what happens today with a lot of mod modern languages too. Um, so I mean, I know in .NET you have like an intermediate language. I mean that that um, uh, I don't. I, it's a little bit different because you have DLLs and stuff. Uh, you know, link link files and everything, but yeah, I think it's interesting to see like these bits and pieces of history still remains almost in spirit sort of even in the modern age. It, it just kind of speaks to um, like how well it worked. Uh, What's that? DNA code, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the DNA is still kind of there a little bit, I think. Yeah, it's interesting. Josh? How do you get your programs from the quick assembler onto your C64? Um, so I do have, uh, so I have a floppy drive, but um, of course there's no easy way to hook that up to a modern system uh, to move programs to the floppy drive. But what I did do, I should have brought it. Um, I do, I did build a, um, there is a, an image for the Raspberry Pi that uh, runs as a six, C64 floppy drive emulator. Uh, so you can load up the SD cards with pro, like compiled programs, essentially, um, and then you plug it into the floppy drive port on this Commodore 64, and it acts just like a, a regular floppy drive. Um, there, there is actually like an operating system too. Like you, you run the program from the uh, Raspberry Pi in the Commodore 64, and it gives you like a little file browser, so you can like click through and choose the floppy disk that you want to emulate, and then it loads it up. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Um, yeah, the floppy, the floppy drives are weird though, like the actual floppy drives. I did look into if there are adapters or something for modern systems, but I think it gets weird because like, I forget what it is, the voltages are just completely different. Um, and what is interesting too is that the floppy drives, as I understand, have their own C65 to C or 6502 CPU in them. They're basically an entirely separate computer, but without a lot of the other uh, like peripheral peripheral I/O type stuff. So, yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? Is your C64 able to run on this board? Oh yeah. Bring it out yeah, yeah, it totally works. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. It's a nice uh, like piece of history. Um, it's the oldest system I have, but yeah, I want to collect more. The Apple II would be awesome, or like an IBM PC would be really cool too. So. How did the CD say anything about the stack? So it says R instruction. I assume that that involves a stack. Yeah, I think there is. I think there is a stack. I forget how big it is though. Um, and I, I'm sure you can interact with, with it like manually, but I don't think there's any like built-in like stack push, pull type thing. Um, but I could be wrong there. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't messed with it too much outside of JSR and RTS type thing. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks.